good morning. It is Monday, March 23rd, 2015. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, Benjamin Netanyahu awaits a green light from the Israeli president to form a coalition as ties with Washington deteriorate. Shiite Houthi militia make gains against government forces in Yemen, pushing the United States to evacuate its citizens. And later on the show, some good news, maybe for some. Barcelona beats arch rivals Real Madrid 2 to 1 in Spain's Super Classico. Good morning, I'm Yael Avi, and we begin here in Israel, where the leaders of the various political parties began meeting with the president yesterday, the Israeli president, to give him their recommendations for who should form the next government. Now, the consultations are rather symbolic this time around in light of the Likud's decisive election win and the fact that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is already believed to have the support of more than 61 lawmakers, the minimum needed for him to get the nod from the Israeli president. Meanwhile, the coalition that Netanyahu is set to desire and which is taking place and shape in backroom conversations already looks ready to put Jerusalem on a collision course with Washington. President Obama and other administration officials have signaled that the United States may change its policies when it comes to Israel, a prospect that should have politicians here worried. Joining me in studio is former Netanyahu's media advisor, Aviv Bushinsky. Mr. Bushinsky, Hi, good, good morning. morning to you. Of course, political blogger, journalist, Tal Schneider, good morning, good morning to you. And before we move along, let's take a look at the following report. One of the thorniest issues that Prime, a Prime Minister has to face when forming a, a government in Israel is the division of portfolios between the prospective partners. So the following report gives us the details of some of the haggling and nagging Netanyahu will have to deal with only from within his home, so to speak, before he deals with the outer world. Let's take a look. It was indeed a sweeping victory for the re-elected Benjamin Netanyahu and the nature of the brightest coalition is pretty predictable. But before he can set it up, the official procedure has to be observed. We have been through a stormy and passionate election period. This is the time to begin a process of mending and healing in Israeli society. While the government which will be formed will have been elected by a majority of Israeli citizens, it must provide an answer to the needs of all the citizens of Israel. All throughout Sunday and Monday, the 10 Israeli party leaders will arrive here to the president's residence for the official round of uh, consultations, during which each one will make his own recommendation for the uh, premiership. Israeli President Rubi Rivlin aims to conclude this process of establishing the new government as quickly as possible. But even though there are no surprises expected in regard to the identity of the new prime minister, there are still many challenges ahead. I believe that uh, our responsibility is uh, to form a stable government, a government that should be formed uh, without any delay. The division of ministries already adds to Netanyahu's burden. He will have to consider both his right-wing party allies and his own party members within the Likud, many of them already jockeying for top positions. At the center of the conflict is the defense ministry, which Israel Beitin leader Avigdor Lieberman already declared earmarked for himself, but which Netanyahu might decide to give to a close ally and so reappoint Moshe Alon. Another problem is the foreign ministry, which both Jewish home leader Naftali Bennett and Likud member Yuval Steinitz covert. And even though the finance ministry is already promised to Moshe Kahlon of Ulanu, the powerful parliamentary finance committee is wanted by both Kahlon and the ultra-Orthodox United Jewish Torah Party. Until Netanyahu solves this puzzle, he will have to deal with the unequivocal criticism of the right-wing coalition in the making by no other than Israel's greatest ally, U.S. President Barack Obama. Is there any reason at this point to believe that he's serious about a Palestinian state? Uh, well, we take him at his word when he said that uh, it wouldn't happen during his uh, prime ministership. And so uh, that's why we've got to evaluate uh, what other uh, options are available to make sure that we don't see uh, a chaotic situation in the region. No one, including Netanyahu himself, thought these difficulties will be easy to overcome. And this highly challenging beginning only adds more pressure. <laughs> Tal Schneider, Aviv Bushinsky in studio. Tal Schneider, I want to start with you. Um, um, let's let's take a look first of all at the United States-Israeli relations as they stand on the table right now. When we hear the American president saying we're going to take Benjamin Netanyahu at his word, how worried should the Israeli government be? You know, when the United States is saying we are we're looking to 
possibly change our policies when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to the Israel-Palestine issue? What does that mean? That means that the process that the Palestinians have already started may exp expedite. Uh, it means that, you know, even uh, before that we understood Israeli people, and I think the American people or the American president understood Netanyahu is not willing, has no political will to go forward with the Palestinian state. And Netanyahu kept saying, you know, don't judge me according to a party, written party platform, judge me according to my performance. And his performance, obviously, in the last six years uh, suggested that he has no interest in that. But his t last 24 hours um, statement, it's actually 48 hours before the election statement, actually made it even more clear to the other side to move forward. It gave more, um, it gave more, uh, you know, bargaining chips for the Palestinians to, you know, move, you know, more swiftly with the UN and at the High Court of Justice in uh, uh, in Europe. So uh, obviously, if um, if uh, there's going to be a resolution uh, at the UN Security Council, uh, they have more leverage. On the Israeli side, okay, when it come, you know, when we one have to, to take that. into account though, that if, if the, indeed the uh, U.S. will not use its veto and there will be a resolution, it doesn't mean that the Palestinian state will, you know, will be on the grounds, right? It's 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 a UN resolution. It doesn't mean it happens because while well, the Israeli government, you know, it's not pulling back its troops or it's not behaving as the Palestinian state. I, I think state, we're looking so at, at the most likely at, at those steps as something that gestures to the world. Maybe Avi Bushinsky. No, that's a question to you as we as we move along. The gestures to the world, the relationship between the United States and Israel. As somebody who's worked with Netanyahu, I'm asking you out loud, there seems to be, an analyst say, that there seems to be almost like a blood pact between the American Republicans and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Both the Congress speech, John Boehner on his way to Israel in two weeks. <clears throat> is, is Netanyahu betting his cards on the fact that he thinks there's going to be a Republican pe president <clears throat> in 2016? First of all, he bet uh, before and failed to, um, to succeed. Uh, I think that the, in this case, Netanyahu uh, doesn't have the political uh, even uh, power, not only the will, but the power to do anything more um, towards the Palestinians. He won't gamble. He won't gamble on anything. Things will be quite uh, stagnant. As, I as see they it. were for the last two as years. Were, yeah, and if you compare his first term to this term, as in his first term he had a right-wing coalition. You're talking about 96, yeah, 1996. Yeah, between right. 96 and 99. In 98, he went to White Plantation under the assumption that he will have a safe net from the left. And then he gave away or implemented the agreement of giving uh, back Wait, Hebron. Uh, Hebron and uh, gradually giving more land to the Palestinians. When he went back, he realized that uh, though he had the safe net, he lost the right. And he said, I can't count. I was there at that time. I can't count on the left that they'll, uh, that they'll uh, support me forever and ever, and he broke again to the right. Now, time has changed. Now there is no internal pressure on Netanyahu to do any big concessions to the Palestinians. Internal pressure, you mean international pressure? Most no, likely. internal Israeli pressure. Internal Israeli yeah. pressure. No, no, mm -hmm. valid, valid, valid point. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Israeli pressure, <clears throat> before we continue with this, um, uh, we are joined by Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, standing outside the Israeli president's residence where all the commotion when it comes to what Netanyahu has to deal with internally um, in the next several days, and all these consultations are taking care. What is on the plate of Ruby Rivlin, um, uh, Tal, when it comes to the consultations of forming um, uh, a coalition this morning? Well, uh, good morning, Yael. We're actually inside the president's residence, but we're way early. It'll take about two hours until the uh, first uh, representatives of the Eshatid party will be arriving here this morning. In the past two days, there um, in these two days, there is marathon meetings of the party leaders. Of course, everyone comes and meets with the president, has their uh, words, and uh, gives their recommendation who should form the next government. But given Netanyahu's landslide victory, the, uh, um, the answer is already clear, and basically this is just the form Formality. On Wednesday, when the president will receive uh, the uh, official results, the final official results from the Central Election Committee of the Elections, he will uh, officially give uh, Netanyahu the task of forming the next government. But actually, here we're seeing a lot of photo ops, we're seeing a lot of statements, but the real action is already behind the scenes. Even though the coalition negotiations only start officially on Wednesday, Netanyahu is already engaged in uh, tough talks with his partners. And uh, um, the Likud uh, members 
leaders we speak to do say that Netanyahu wants to enlist the ultra-Orthodox uh, parties on his government first, to have them join the government first. He thinks they're a sure bet and that their support is much less controversial or much less pr uh, problematic than the other uh, coalition partners. But today, it'll be a more interesting day than yesterday. Yesterday ended with, uh, ended with a tally of uh, 51 recommendations for Netanyahu and only 24 of the Zionist Union recommending Herzog. Today, this morning, uh, we will be seeing the representatives of Yesh Atid, Kulanu, and uh, Avigdor Lieberman's Yesh Beitenu, so, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, Israel Beitenu. So this, uh, today is going to be a bit more interesting. But at the end of the day, it's quite clear that given Netanyahu's landslide victory, he will be the one. Uh, President Rivlin doesn't really have a choice at this moment. Even though he was pushing, and he might be still pushing for a unity government, at the moment, it doesn't seem in the cards. No, as, as I was about to ask you exactly that, when it comes to President Ruby Rivlin, who is gesturing and trying to push for unity government. But that's something that Netanyahu doesn't need. And I want to look with you, though, when we're looking at a broader coalition other than the ultra-Orthodox, yes, Shatid, that, that doesn't put them inside that coalition. But it seems like a sure thing for a right-wing coalition. Am I right in saying that, Tal? Well, definitely. Actually, I think that before the elections, uh, when Netanyahu was vowing to ha not to go into a national unity government, it was mainly an election promise. But given his uh, um, outstanding, I mean, uh, victory in the ballots, he actually has no choice. So he will at least exhaust all his options trying to establish a narrow right-wing uh, government before uh, going to the uh, uh, to to the other option of a national unity government. But one might take into consideration that the pressure we're hearing the international pre pressure we're hearing in the past few days, not only from the U.S., but also from France, also from the European Union, also from the U.N. Sec uh, Secretary General. Everyone is pressuring Netanyahu uh, um, that he has to uh, uh, backtrack from his uh, opposition to a Palestinian state or recommit to the two-state solution. Netanyahu does understand that in this right-wing government, even if he does have a narrow right-wing government, he must have a moderate face, someone, some face to present to the international community that will be able to, uh, um, to engage engage in a dialogue with the international community. And uh, um, I think that is one of the considerations in giving out the, uh, giving out the portfolios inside the narrow right-wing government. And just to say, even in a narrow right-wing government, there are a lot of battles, a lot of spins, a lot of maneuvers, and Netanyahu <laughs> definitely has a few difficult ways, uh, weeks ahead of him. Well, it's the job that he wanted. Tal Shalev, you'll be joining us throughout the show um, uh, later on as well, um, uh, as everybody else stays with us. Thank you. Um, back to actually exactly that, Aviv Bushinsky. You mentioned something very interesting about 1996. You were working with Netanyahu in 96, right. weren't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, and that veer smack back to the right that he has just made. So are we looking at the possibility of the next four years, two years, however long this government is going to, sur you know, to survive in the history of Israel, um, that there is no capitulation, there is no moving progress? What could be the scenario, I'm talking about the Palestinian issue, where Netanyahu can sell the idea of sitting down with the Palestinians with, to, with the type of government that he's about to create? I think that this time Netanyahu believes in what he says. In other words, he'll uh, stick to the word. I, I don't see any way he'll do anything with the Palestinians. First of all, because Netanyahu himself himself learned, and that's what he believes, learned his lesson. As I said, he learned his lesson in 98, and he lost his power due to the fact that he gave uh, land to the Palestinians. He lost the trust of the right. I, now he managed to retain the, their support. I don't think he's going to lose it again. And, and second thing is, there's no internal. We're talking about the U.S., Europe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that trying to convince Netanyahu to do something. But unlike uh, 96, 99, even before the disengagement, there is no internal pressure on Netanyahu to do anything with the Palestinians. I think that many people in Israel will be very happy, and I think that's what Netanyahu is going to focus on, welfare. Change some things in the economy and said, I did my due, this is the thing. Uh, the issues with the Palestinians at this moment is irrelevant. And the last uh, point, which is, I think, the most significant, and Tal, you can... Um, I, I support it, I believe, <laughs> is that you have now a key member in the coalition. It's uh, uh, the Jewish home. Since they have eight seats now, yes. eight and seats. eight seats, if they decide to, uh, to split or to resign, Netanyahu lost his power. Do you think that he's going to gamble on doing something with the Palestinians on the assumption that uh, Israel, that uh, uh, Abayta, you did the, the Jewish, Jewish home, home. Will, will disengage? I don't see it. But it's a little bit, I uh, will take it further than that. The uh, Jewish home will demand in the bylaws of the government to include a statement saying there's no Palestinian state. And obviously, you I think hear, that's what they're going to demand. Yes, they already said so. Yeah. And I hear also from Likud members who 
who will demand to annex some of the portions of the blocks. For example, uh, one of the um, MKs of the Likud who is now aspiring to be a, a minister for the first time, you know, came out and you know said in a, the most clearest way he is looking to put a, a resolution in the new government that will annex Gush Etzion. So I think it's not just not nothing to be done on the Palestinian side. I think some of the Israeli members of the Knesset, which have a majority right now right. and a majority in the government, will demand to move forward with some decision making regarding, you know, lands in dispute. I mean, it's uh, and is you know, that something that a government is such? I mean, obviously, it's something that if it's sanctioned, it can you know pass in Israel. But is that something that the international arena can accept? And but you la you I have to look so. at the internal pressure. It's coming in from the right wing, and yeah, you know, but, you but may ignore you the know, left it, it pressure. Is, There's no left pressure, but, uh, but this the is right all wing. of words. I'll find the right formula how to uh, maneuver and uh, say something yeah, about the Netanyahu settlements and say something uh, about. Uh, if we, again, with a judge on uh, performance, uh, Netanyahu will have another four years of you know maneuvering and obviously doing nothing. No doubt, it's an error. No, 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 the, the status quo is something that I think you know, if any politician would like to, would like to maintain to remain in power. But in that respect, if he tries that maneuvering, and that brings us to Iran, because that's not going away. And that deadline is approaching. <clears throat> Netanyahu has played all his cards, hasn't he? Um, yes, but uh, obviously not not yes fully no. to he the end. One, <laughs> he has one uh, theoretical uh, card that he said that uh, we will act alone. We will act, yeah, yeah. That, no, but theoretically. We will, we, theoretically, we, we, we will see last minute, you know, issues there that are not under Israel's control. We see in France some uh, latest, uh, you know, comments. I'm not absolutely sure. You know, things are all they're not in Israel's hands, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that it will be finalized and done, you know, shortly. No, not shortly, but if we're looking towards a 31st in a um, uh, 31st of March, some type of framework agreement. Yeah, as you as you've mentioned, um, Netanyahu is, um, is sending his advisors or some of his advisors to France to try and stop one of the world powers. But doesn't that isolate him? I and mean, obviously, isolation is the leading word, and that's actually leading word to him. Does Netanyahu realize, as somebody who's worked with him, and, and I, I tend to agree. I think he's changed. I think he's changed, and he's uh, and, uh, that you know. Israel is, there's no other way of looking at it, moving towards complete isolation from, you know, the Western arena of the international world. I think that maybe uh, politically he's not that strong according to the results because of this narrow government, right. okay? But personally he thinks that he is the strongest man in, uh, on earth because he made a great achievement despite all the criticism from the media, from the U.S., from Obama. And the polls. And, and, the, and the polls, exactly. <laughs> yes. So I think that he, th this is uh, easy, the easy part on his uh, side. And, uh, you know, there's a myth that says that if all the stars are being fixed and then Netanyahu survives, <laughs> I think he'll overcome this one as well. No, no it, it's, you know, it is amazing. And I'm asking about, you know, overcoming all these things. Tal Schneider, you and I had a chance to speak shortly before this broadcast began, was it really this last stretch push, and that leads me to the people of Israel, to all the citizens of Israel, <laughs> was it this last stretch push of the last four days of the elections last week? So, that really turned the coin. So we do know from Likud members, again, high-ranking Likud members that were talking to reporters and saying, you know, harsh things. They were already getting ready for the collapse of their government. It was, you know, it wasn't just in the cards or in the stars. It was in the this numbers. This was internal chatter. It, it was, was really in the yeah. numbers. They saw numbers. They were, you know, during the weekend. And obviously, uh, Netanyahu, the politician, the man himself, took it all on his shoulders to turn to turn the tide, and he did it, you know, by, you know, media blitz that was done in the last, you know, few days, uh, all by himself. None of the interviews that other gave, you know, helped only him. And he actually, I mean, we saw it, he actually called every anchor in the country and, you know, went up on uh, radio on stations. On the phone, and, I, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I've heard, but it's true that it was his job, and that's what he did in the last three days, and he surprised, surprised everybody, including himself, with the results. <laughs> but I've heard a nice uh, uh, analysis by a senior, uh, 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 minister in his party, he said, yes, you know, everybody says it's all Netanyahu, Netanyahu, he doesn't count anyone, you know, we went and did all those interviews and nobody, and nobody really cares. <laughs> and you know what, if it was a different leader from the Likud party, let's say Gidon Saar or mm -hmm. another one, 
Netan, uh, uh, we, I think, that's what he said, yeah. we could have uh, make much more than what Netanyahu did. I agree well, because, more, yes. more mandates. Yeah. I totally agree because yeah. the 30 mandates went, you know, he got them while being not very popular candidate, not even on the right wing. So people on the right voted, you know, you know, without, uh, uh, without respect to him personally, on the personal level. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he still is not very liked on the right wing. And yet he won, you know, 30 seats. So if there was a more empathic, uh, right, down uh, to earth. A uh, uh, candidate, you know, someone who with is no connected to the et cetera, et cetera, so yeah. then mm -hmm. you know the numbers might have been even larger. Wow. No, no, that, that's a fascinating point, but I think it all brings it back to actually what the, both of you said and what you said, David Buczynski. The clear veer to the right, which he's going to most likely, we're theorizing here, stick to um, uh, in his next um, uh, in his next term. Fascinating information. Um, Tal Schneider, Avi Buczynski, I want to thank you very much thank for you. being with me thank this you. morning as we move along. Yemen, where President um, Abed Rabu Mansour Hadi accused the Iranian allied Houthi militia that controls the capital Sana of staging a coup against him, claiming he will raise Yemen's flag in the Houthis' northern stronghold. The Houthis did not directly respond to the speech, but called for a general mobilization of their armed forces, successfully seizing the airport in the central Yemenite town of Taiz. Now, this comes days after four suicide bombers blew themselves up on Friday in two mosques in the Yemenite capital Sana, leaving at least over 100 people dead, hundreds more wounded. In response to the recent developments, Washington said it will evacuate all its staff from the country. Yemen has been hurling towards civil war since last year when the Houthis seized Sana and advanced into the Sunni areas, leading clashes with local tribes and energizing a southern separatist movement and, of course, completely destabilizing yet again another faction of this region. So we're going to break this down very shortly. Let's watch a report on where the recent developments stand in Yemen and break it down from there. Two days after the horrific terror attack, the situation in Yemen continues to entangle. According to Yemeni security officials, Shia rebels who support former President Ali Abdullah Saleh have taken over crucial installations in the country's third largest city of Taiz and its airport. Yemeni President Abed Rabu Mansour Hadi accused the Iranian allied Houthi militia, which controls the capital Sana, of staging a coup against him and promised to raise Yemen's flag over rebel strongholds. I call on all political parties to feel the seriousness of the current phase and ignore partisan views and to actively participate in the talks, which I called for to be held in the Gulf Cooperation Council in Riyadh. In the meantime, the U.S. evacuated 100 troops from Yemen from an airbase near the city of El Huta. And in Sana'a, the body count of the coordinated suicide attacks that took place Friday is still underway. Though the Yemeni branch of the Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attacks, U.S. officials said there is no indication that this information is accurate. We cannot at this point confirm the veracity of the claim of these extremists that they were affiliated, by, affiliated with the Islamic State. Along with the fighting in Syria and Iraq, this Middle Eastern country has become one of the main targets for terrorism in recent months. In January, the Houthis seized the presidential palace and captured Mansour, who had to flee to the central city of Aden. Following these latest events, it is not entirely unrealistic that the country will be dragged into another civil war that will leave it divided to two countries exactly as it was before 1990. Joined by I-24 News senior Middle East analyst Ali Waqid Ali, good morning good to morning. you. Yemen taking a further step towards destabilization. Looking at you know what's going on right now, are the Houthis going to completely take over? I know we're theorizing what can be done, and if the Americans are disengaging or pulling everybody out, is the world even going to get involved? Um, I'm afraid that the world will be in, uh, obliged to uh, get involved. The question is when and uh, whether it's going to be uh, uh, late or not, like we uh, uh, saw in, in Syria, for example. And Syria is Or if the they're going to come in at all when it comes to exactly. Syria. Exactly. Syria yeah. is the world that was pronounced by the uh, UN uh, uh, envoy to the uh, uh, Qatari uh, crisis, Ben Omar, who said that there are all the components needed in order to uh, turn Yemen into a second edition of, uh, of Syria. Syria. Everybody is... Uh, 
uh, fighting everybody, an ethnic uh, 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 war that is supported by uh, uh, regional uh, rivals, Iran on one hand, Saudi and uh, Qatar on the uh, on the other hand. The, uh, uh, geographically, the country is being uh, uh, split between uh, north and uh, and south, and I'm afraid that uh, Yemen will not be uh, the same uh, Yemen. The uh, demands of the southern to be uh, to be uh, to become an independent uh, state are emerging as uh, this uh, crisis uh, go on and uh, for the moment uh, yeah it's very interesting to see that even the army is divided uh, aircrafts of the Yemenite army were uh, flying uh, beyond the um, <coughs> beyond the uh, uh, the palace of uh, president uh, Hadi, Hadi who is the official uh, ruler, uh, yeah. ruler of uh, of Yemen, and this shows that the army is uh, uh, is divided. Security forces are uh, divided. Uh, the, the government, the official government of Mansour Hadi, is fighting both the uh, Al Qaeda and the Islamic State on on one hand, right. and the rivals of Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, who are the uh, Houthis, on the uh, other hand. So here we have the cocktail that is uh, threatening uh, to turn Yemen very uh, quickly into not even another uh, uh, Iraq but another Syria. Another Syria, which is the terrifying thing. And let us not forget about the people of Yemen, as we try to also remind people of the people of Syria. And we also join via Skype by Human Rights Watch, Yemen researcher Belkis Willi. Belkis, good morning to you. Thank you for being with us. You have spent many, you know, you've spent a lot of time in Yemen. You are covering that region. When it comes to the people of Yemen, where do things stand? I, mean, I, th I think that people do not realize that it's been also already several years that not just, you, you know, human issues, human rights are already in contention in Yemen, but where does this put the people of Yemen? Uh, thank you for having me, Yael. Uh, as, as you mentioned, there have been serious human rights concerns in Yemen for, for decades. We Human Rights Watch have been covering those issues. We're dealing with the poorest country in the Middle East, one of the poorest countries in the world, a country fast running out of water. Most um, acute problems include a uh, lack of access to electricity, lack of access to food. And of course, in that context, when you've got multiple armed conflicts going on within the country between the different warring factions, the vulnerable populations are the ones that suffer most. Um, in addition, there are violations coming out of those conflicts directly, like indiscriminate attacks on civilians, uh, targeting of schools, use of child soldiers, many, many other violations. Yeah, it's a terrifying thing to, th to see, sadly, to both of you in the short time where they have. Ali, I'm looking at the Middle East. Syria no longer exists. Iraq no longer exists. So we can say these things, right? They're fractured places. Exactly. Yemen falls apart. What happens to the whole chess board? Well, it would be uh, much more. Uh, it would be even much more interesting than than Iraq because uh, Yemen is the backyard of of uh, Saudi Arabia and a strategic uh, uh, goal and country uh, for Saudi Arabia. And if the uh, Iranian allies uh, militia, the Houthis, continue uh, uh, to gain uh, ground on on Yemen, they uh, almost took uh, the totally of the city, the third city in the country, uh, uh, Taiz, after taking uh, full control of uh, of the capital uh, Sanaa. Uh, uh, it means that the Saudis will be at least obliged to uh, intervene like they are doing in, in Syria and Iraq in supporting other militias, other militias that are not uh, 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 characterized by being uh, democratic and respecting uh, human uh, uh, rights. We uh, we see the, the flirting between the Saudis and some militias in, in Syria and Iraq, like Jabhat al-Nusra right. al and, uh, and other. So, uh, uh, but from this whole mess, we are identifying that the international community, unlike Syria and, uh, and Iraq, are yes. saying that for for us, uh, uh, Mansour Hadi is the uh, official is the uh, uh, president. Is the president. We will, uh, you know, fascinating times, sad ones in that. Thank you for me. When we get back, a synagogue in London attacked by a group of people chanting, I'm going to kill you Jews. We'll take a closer look at that. First, the news. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I-24 News Morning Edition, the place you should be on this March 23rd. <laughs> 2015, that would be Ruthie Sinai, I-24 News, senior news editor, usually very good on the day, um, who usually. usually, who joins me um, daily to discuss the news you missed while scanning the headlines. With us in studio also, Jonathan Sashadati, I-24 News, um, uh, European 
contribute your correspondent. Very happy to have him here in person. But we move to you, Ruthie. What, are, what is the news? Okay, so uh, Paris in the spring. It's really nice, isn't it? Yeah. So I uh, love Paris apparently, in the spring time. yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah. so does Yuval uh, Steinitz yes. and uh, <laughs> a bunch of very senior Israeli security officials who have uh, gone to Paris to meet today uh, with uh, French officials. Uh, they're, uh, this is from Haaretz. Um, France ahead of the final round of Iran nuclear talks. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. going to be meeting with Fabius, the foreign minister, and other senior. Why France, you may ask? Not just the spring weather, but uh, because France, out of the f five uh, world well, powers, well, six world powers actually, right. uh, negotiating with Iran, is considered to be uh, the most uh, amicable, to, uh, the mo not amenable. I would say amenable to Israel, amenable. but rather more, you know, harsh possibly in the Iranian framework. Right, right. Framework more hardline towards, or at least perceived as more hardline towards Iran. Tal Shalev with us at the um, uh, Israeli president's um, uh, Ruby Rivlin um, uh, residence following the developments today of forming coalition. This trip to France, the last push from Netanyahu to try and stop the framework deal, can it even work? Well, uh, Israel is definitely putting its hope on France following uh, um, two, uh, two historic events, actually. One, November 2013, where uh, ahead of the, uh, uh, s the interim deal that was signed between the P5 plus one and uh, Iran, in that case, before in, bef in that round of negotiations, France did actually save the day and did uh, um, sure. succeed to improve the deal that was on the table. So the, um, this uh, uh, weekend, uh, after a long talk with President Francois Hollande, who called uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to congratulate for him for his uh, victory. Um, Netanyahu does uh, order, or uh, actually uh, orders uh, um, Yuval Steinitz, the intelligence minister, to go to France to try and uh, move on with their, uh, uh, to try and influence the negotiations. This is because over the weekend, France again did demonstrate a very hard line, a tougher stance, and did um, uh, warn or alert, alert the P5 plus one that they might be rushing into a deal uh, um, by the 31 of uh, March deadline. But nevertheless, we might say that a, a French source, a French official that was quoted on Reuters did say that uh, Israel has marginalized itself and that its demands are unrealistic. So it's not because of any love of Israel that France is now presenting a tougher stand on Iran. If at all, it's because of France's close connections with the moderate Arab Sunni states, and that is their uh, uh, main concern. But nevertheless, Israel is putting all of its hopes on France, trying to influence this last uh, deal, uh, this last uh, moment deal, the last uh, uh, moments ahead of the deal. Right. And uh, in any case, uh, the fact that the communications between Washington and Jerusalem are not so good at the moment uh, does mean that Israel has to put much more effort into the other uh, partners of the P5 plus one. And uh, no, def um, uh, def definitely so. Tal Shalev, I-24, who's diplomatic correspondent at the Israeli president's house, following today also the negotiations to form a coalition. Um, uh, thank you. Now, yes, moving along. So I agree with everything she everything said. Everything she said. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, uh, you know, Israel, uh, you know, is sort of Mr. Tough Guy about all this Iran stuff. And Sarah Palin, remember her? <gasps> she the likes, woman that can see Russia from her house. She, right. likes, she likes tough guys. So um, she put up two posters. Uh, on her Facebook page, congratulating, oh my Lord. yeah, congratulating <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, okay. and wow. um, yeah, Did she, she says. Send a shotgun? Uh, no, 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 mm -hmm. she's actually very, you know, she says, thank you to the good people of Israel for supporting a leader who will stand up and fight for all the free world and other leaders while other leaders sit down. While other leaders yeah. sit down. Heartland okay. of America will sleep better, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was another poster that said, when we, when Israel is safe, we are safe. So that's, uh, you know, from the Alaskan uh, From heartland. the Alaskan um, uh, um, yeah. Uh, mountains. Contingent, yeah, yes. Yeah, mm, moving on. Okay. Um, Speaking of people who aren't maybe sleeping so well these days, actually, um, Islamic State has published um, a call on a bunch of um, social media sites, yeah, uh, for uh, you know for yes. believers to kill these heathens. These I'm going uh, jihad, jihad with Inuit military. Yeah, yeah, these are they posted. It's very frightening, actually. They apparently hacked some military networks or something and posted photos and addresses, home addresses of pilots, American pilots, you know, Air Force, Navy, uh, Marine pilots. Uh, that's a, that's, a, that's yeah. an act of terrorism. And that's a, absolutely. As we know, yeah. And as a call on, uh, you know, IS supporters to, you know, go out and, and kill them. 
uh, says, you know, we've made it easy for you by giving you the address. All you need to do is take the final steps. So what are you waiting for? Any reactions from the U.S. Um, uh, military? Are, the or Pentagon says they're, they're looking into it. Yeah. yeah. Really. Um, yet again, yeah. a force that cannot um, be stopped. And okay. So um, speaking of nothing, actually, um, farewell to a king. Farewell to a king being Richard yeah. the Third. Now I don't know if you remember your Shakespeare, but Richard the That's uh, the what I have third. Jonathan Sashadati in studio for. A bit yeah, shiny there, isn't it? <laughs> I guess that's what happens when they dig you up after. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Wait see, the sec. thing is, okay. Here's the deal. The thing is, uh, you remember what he said: "My kingdom for a horse." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right now, what he's saying actually is, "My kingdom for a hearse," because. <laughs> <Not> very good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rum pum pum. Yeah. yeah well, uh, okay. You know, they they dug up his bones, Richard the uh, Third, who died in 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth, and uh, Boswell, Bos Bosworth, Jonathan, Jonathan, Boswell, one of them, Boswell. and which is near Leicester. <laughs> Um, the okay. local okay. council okay, was okay, building. Okay, but, the, but the stinger. Why did they dig up his okay. body? Okay, it was it was by accident. Well, uh, he they was were building in a car park. That's, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, yeah. So it's building... not a great place for a king's final resting place. Exactly, spot. exactly. So that's considered, you know, not very distinguished. And so they found. How did these... they find out that he was buried in the car park? Because they did were they... digging up the car park to build something. The local council. And then was... it was just like, oh my God, there's Richard yeah. the Third. Well, no, there, there's there's <laughs> somebody. <laughs> I have to say, it's a bit like here in Israel, where you know they start to dig something and yeah, make a housing development. You find an ancient cemetery. An ancient cemetery, and, and then yeah. poltergeist yeah. ensues. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> so they spent uh, two years, uh, you know, I'm not looking, making light of this. Yeah. Looking, uh, you know, looking at the skull. I mean, there's actually a skull and bones. You can, yeah. We don't have a picture, but we can see it. And, and, and that's uh, he was a good looking guy. There was some debate well, over whether or not, you know, he should be relocated, where to relocate yeah, right. him. And so it's become, even though it's, you know, quite an old uh, case. I think there's some discussion over what's the appropriate thing to do with a former king. Well, they're going to they're going to give him a proper burial exactly. this time. But uh, it's not a funeral. It's just a reburial. Because right. it did it's happen. It did funeral. happen. They right. already had the party. Yeah. I'm not making well, no, 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 but he didn't have a funeral <laughs> the first time because they just dumped him in some place. Right, because right. it was... Okay. Which became a car park. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which became Eventually. a car park. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I hope they're going to use a horse in that funeral. Uh, uh -huh. A hearse. Yes, and one last one. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, sex worker. Sex what? Sex workers? Sex workers, yes. Sex workers. Northern she Ireland. A challenge against okay. Yeah, uh, she's leading a challenge against this uh, prostitution ban that's been enforced or being enforced in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is the only place in the uh, British Commonwealth yes. uh, where uh, it's illegal to uh, pay for sex. And uh, so she uh, and a bunch of uh, the, the the ones leading the 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 law, or, you know, behind the law, uh, are a bunch of nuns. So she's huh. going up against. I them. wouldn't want to argue with her. And, you know, no, I was like, I was just thinking. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, was, I was looking a little scared. Yeah. But Ruthie, thank yeah. you for that. As so, we move along, fascinating sure. stuff, especially Richard III. Thank yeah. you. Moving along now, a synagogue in a London suburb of Stamford Hill was a victim, and we're moving along to something completely damn different, so I'm sadly without a wiper. A synagogue in the London suburb of Stamford Hill was victim to what police are considering an anti-Semitic incident after a group of approximately 20 youth, many believed to be intoxicated after coming from a nearby party, tried to break into the synagogue. The young men yelled threats, vandalized property, and became physically violent with members of the congregation. One witness said that the assailants were shouting, we will kill you as they entered and began attacking the worshippers and tearing apart prayer books. Now, we are joined in studio by Jonathan Satchadotti of um, uh, I-24 News um, uh, London, actually a European correspondent. Um, the worries do not just end with the UK also. We, have, we were here getting reports this morning that in Hungary, um, uh, actually a, a Jewish cemetery was being vandalized. About 20 graves were vandalized in a Jewish cemetery in Hungary just this morning or yesterday, late last the night. the bones were thrown all over the exactly. place. Exactly. They had so stones shattered, human remains scattered on the ground. Um, a very valid point. This is not just um, um, singular to the UK. But, Jonathan, you were this today. Um, let's first of all take a look at a clip from the synagogue that um, uh, suffered this attack over the course of the weekend and try and break it down from there. Let's have a look. Now, Jonathan, when you look at something like that, I want to talk about London, actually about the UK to begin with. 
Anti-Semitism in the UK. You're Jewish, you live there. How bad of a problem is it? Well, what we've just seen there in that video is, of course, terrifying to anyone. You can imagine being in that room and that mob being outside. Yeah. It's worth saying that that's in a neighborhood where there's roughly 30,000 Jewish people. Stamford Hill is a very high-density Jewish population area, many of them Haredim or right. Yemenite Jews. So that particular incident is said to have happened without forward planning or targeting Jews specifically. There was a birthday party apparently going on opposite the building. Some people in the party were drunk. Some Jewish people used that synagogue as a social place to hang out yeah. at night. So it was late as at night. As happens in many synagogues. Yeah, and yeah. young people were there. There was a brawl outside. It escalated into a fist fight and then it pursued uh, into, it turned into this attack where they barricaded themselves inside and the attackers smashed through the windows, as you can see here, with yeah. those chairs, sticks. One um, boy I spoke to there, a 17-year-old boy who was inside the synagogue, told me they had wooden sticks. They were smashing through the windows. They didn't care who they might hit with them. One man was, in fact, hit in the head. They say he may have lost a tooth, and he was taken to hospital. He was from the Shomrim, which is a volunteer uh, protection group. It's run by the Jewish community in that neighborhood, and they came as an emergency response, arriving sometime before the police did. The Shomrim in Hebrew meaning guards, there is actually a group of people that from within the community that guards the community. Why? That's the point that, it, that I find slightly disturbing. Actually. Absolutely. So within that neighborhood, the Shomrim operate. They operate in a sort of certain area of uh, London. And it's a very good question. And as well as the Shomrim, there are other organizations like the Community Security Trust, which operates nationally in the United Kingdom. And these are Jewish groups mm, staffed by some professional staff in the case of the CST, but mostly volunteers who stand outside synagogues and guard them. And the Shomrim provide a sort of emergency neighborhood response. And they feel the need to actually, you know, protect themselves and, and, and this isn't a recent thing that's existed for years for years for years okay now there is an argument and you and I have had this discussion many times that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with his statements towards the Jews of Europe come in stroves and you know and because this is the place for you is Israel are actually harming the Jewish stand within the British society short time that we have I also want to turn to somebody on the phone with us because the rise of anti-Semitic incidents is not just, as we said, is not just singular. That's Hannah Weisfeld, director of Yachad in the UK. Hannah, you actually, you're part of a group of people, unlike, you know, what we've just discussed, you actually sent a letter to Prime Minister Netanyahu saying that he, he is the one who's harming the standing of Jews in Britain or, you know, he's not speaking for you, correct? Well, the letter didn't say he was harming our standing. The letter was particularly about um, it was sent a couple of days ago, and the letter was referencing the Israeli elections and the right. rhetoric he had used in the in and around the Israeli elections, particularly about the um, the, the voting or about the Arab minority within Israel. And what the letter said was is that when you use language um, such as the language he used, what you do is you drive a wedge between diaspora Jews and Israel, because diaspora Jews, not all, but many diaspora Jews, find language like that um, to be very different or, or to go against the grain of the Jewish values that we've grown up with. And actually, you know, as people who live as a minority in democratic, well, you know, in our case, as British Jews in a democratic country that enjoy full participation right. in democracy, to hear the Israeli Prime Minister bemoan the fact that the Arab minority within Israel are voting, you know, says something about uh, about how we view minorities. And, you know, as Jews, uh, you know, we're the first people to understand what it's like to be a minority. That I wouldn't argue with on, uh, on any front, but I'm asking because Netanyahu has become such a polarizing figure for Jews around the world. I think the interesting thing actually about that is that, you know, there was a poll done by the Jewish Chronicle newspaper who started doing regular polls of a, a group they've put together with a polling company. And they found shortly before the end of the elections that the majority of British Jews they surveyed would actually vote for Netanyahu, which I think is interesting. <laughs> I think this tough stance when you don't necessarily live with his social policies within Israel, where many people find that they somehow resisted his continuing, when you live outside Israel in the diaspora, I think it actually appeals to many regular Jews and in France as well. Some of these Jews, I think, heard the Prime Minister of Israel saying that you could move to Israel, Israel will always defend you, and they enjoyed, perhaps out of their fear of what's going on around them in Europe, this tough stance. So it is interesting to see that sometimes Netanyahu is accused of actually appealing to Jews around the world rather yeah. than to the Jews within Israel. So I think to maybe associate the anti-Semitism rising in Europe with his actions might be going a step okay, too but far. Hannah, Hannah, with you on, on the line, is it, and this is the, to the two of you, because I wouldn't know, I live here, is it, you know, is, is Netanyahu good for the Jews of the diaspora? 
diaspora or bad for the Jews of the diaspora? Well, I would say two different things, which is that, first of all, I, you know, I think that there, there's a big plethora of opinion within diaspora Jewry and within the British Jewish community, which is, you know, the community that I know well. Right. And it might be that there are some Jews that, you know, would, would vote for Netanyahu if they were in Israel, but th th there are many that I think find his policies difficult and you know if the Israeli electorate are the people that vote him and that's their democratic right and we as Jews outside of Israel obviously don't have a say in that however okay. the Prime Minister of Israel does often go out into the public domain to Washington particularly to speak on behalf of the Jewish people and I think that you know what I think what's difficult is that as Jews we make it very clear that we want to see a separation between how people view the policies of a foreign government which no, understood. is the state and, of Israel. And I'm not cutting you off and it's sadly all the time we have so and all I have to is, is for Jonathan to smile. Come back first the news. back. It is still Monday, March 23rd, 2015. This is still the morning edition. Last I checked, I'm still Yelavi. Thank you for staying with us. As you should have, why? In light of the international success and popularity of Israeli dance companies, Batsheva and Bador, dance festival directors from all over the world are setting their sights on the local scene this week. The Machon Shalev Dance House, an incubator for Israeli performers together with the foreign ministry, are hosting artistic directors from 30 countries to introduce them to the off to to the offerings focusing on performances tailoring for children tailored for children and teens now over the course of the last of three days the visitors will watch a marathon of dozens of dance acts with the goal of inviting them to their respective festivals joining me in studio is choreographer ruby edelman good morning to you good morning you are the ceo and artistic co-director of the machol shalev dance house and before we try and break this down and why the Israeli dancers are so successful, let's have a look at the following clip of what it is that you guys are offering. And take it from there. Wow. So, explain to me, why is Israel such a hub for dancing? Because many people will argue that, you know, there's not much dancing going on here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know. I think we're coming from a, a good starting point uh, with the fact that Israel is already a dance empire and no proportion it's not to the, it. It's not the high-tech empire, it's the dance empire. Probably, wow. okay. yeah. Uh, and we are taking it from there with the fact that the uh, Machol Shalem Dance House is setting a goal to, to promote excellency in dance, in professional dance. And uh, since we did few times uh, international exposures event for uh, adult dance, right. in this point we decided to, to focus on how we give also to the young audience the most professional uh, companies to work and to to make works which are specifically meant for this young audience also to build them as a future public but also to really challenge ourselves not to go to light entertainment uh, easily to challenge their patient to try to see what this field can offer from the professional level of all the israeli dancing that we are working with in this direction. In this direction. Now, how young, just in terms of, you know, the kids that I'm looking at uh, at dance footage, but when you say that you're trying to cater to kids, what does that mean and what are the ages? And Actually, it's very from very young, four, year six. Four? Yeah, it's the, really every work that has uh, been made, people are trying to decide rather early to which no no I'm, I'm, I'm asking selfishly I have a two and a half year old I'm looking for something for her to do before I'm uh, four four I started four. dancing I, at seven I, you see where that ended yeah but as a public <laughs> I mean yesterday yes. yesterday we had a show of Guy Gutman uh, non troppo and I could see four years old kids freaking out on the really? show like, really like like choreography and, and, and choreography. Whatnot. they wanted to join on stage dance and that's usually the point you understand you 
you did the you right got thing. It. You did the right thing. If they yeah. want to be on stage dancing, and wow! Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. And when you said that you have to, I mean, other than, and I know you're here to push things, but that Israel is a dance empire. That's something we don't hear for every day. How much? How much so? I mean, how involved is Israel in the dance world? There is something with my experience. Uh, even if you are an independent choreographer in Israel and you are in this scene, an average. Uh, in an yeah. average level, the moment you perform abroad, usually you are sold out just because you're from Israel. There is this uh, branding uh, yeah. image uh, that goes all over, which uh, very good uh, choreographers before us did. And right. I'm very, how you say, we take this heritage and we try to stand up to the criteria. But uh, apparently, this is the status of the Israeli dance. It's a collaboration of. Uh, something which have the mixture here in Israel, the location, which is a Mediterranean uh, location, location plus European orientation of uh, culture, and the mixture of those things create something which is less uh, common. Because yeah, what came to mind right, right now was like belly ballet. Yeah. Yep, that's. I wasn't making this. I was. No, this you is a you go thing. from the roots, but uh, okay. you talk about uh, very formal uh, techniques, and when you mix those things, you you really get things which are apparently appealing to a lot of people and challenging a lot of new wow. methods. Tal, were you a dancer? I need some liquor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> it's not the smart thing to do, you know, for four-year-old, as you were talking before. I was about thinking, I'm I need just some saying, liquor first. I need some liquor. I'm just going to plow my two and a half <laughs> then with some alcohol and She's then send her to your class. She's going to dance. Line of yeah. shots before you go on stage. And, uh, no, actually, I think that <laughs> women, for right, uh, clip. Yeah. Yeah, like in do. weddings and, and, and ceremonies and stuff like that, um, women, we, we don't need the liquor, actually, to dance. But men, they always say they do. Yeah, yeah true. true. Right? Except for you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had my uh, yeah. You my had my share. I had my time to try. To and break. where the ch and when we talk about um, about groups like Bato and Bacheva, because I'm I'm back to the empire of dance. Bacheva is very big overseas, right? Bacheva, yeah, is the probably the most known name, brand name of Israel and dance, which connect. Uh, but again, there is a whole huge field of creative works which are much more fringe, much more experimental. Bacheva is for us, people who right. work now in the field is already considered dance history. As for, <laughs> and this in the yeah. sense that we are so much already, this is Advanced. the obvious thing and we are already checking things. And those things we are interested to share with other people, not what already was recognized. But the, the, rec the hub is for, so give me the name of it again. It's the, um, uh, it's the, the call, sorry. The International Exposure, uh, for, of dance for children and young people. And young people. Uh, Minus, and liquor. Okay. Minus, Minus liquor. Minus the liquor. Uh, plus fun. No, no, no. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and you're locked in studio as we move to the liquor dancer. Um, uh, Tal, yeah, Tal Heiner, uh, who's here with the world review and anything and everything that is the spiral viral. Yes, and I want to start with a picture that went viral, very, very viral in the past two days. Uh, maybe you saw it, it's coming from India in the eastern state of Bihar, where um, this is actually defining family values. Yes, these are parents, yell yeah, who climbed this wall of, of a school in Bihar, <laughs> helping their kids cheat on an exam. So they were basically handing their children, 10th graders. That's quite a lot of parents there. It's a lot yeah, of parents. Okay. They're yeah, and they their risked kids. their lives, as you can see. This is like the fourth yeah, and, and the, fifth the floor. Yeah, fourth and the third floor. And they were they're climbing they to get their kids. They handed them cheat sheets while taking the exam. Oh my God. And, um, and there's, I mean, there's a funny side I'm to the story. I'm gonna talk to my mother, she never did that uh, Maybe you should start no, doing it for, it for your my, Yeah, for, for my two and a half year old. Yes, go ahead. But, but um, so this is the funny side of, of this picture, but there's also a sad side, you know, because the competition there is so tight. Yeah. And um, many students, they just, they get expelled from schools because they can't handle uh, the stress. And a recent study in India showed that only 48% of fifth graders are actually able to read a second grade textbook. So, yes, I'm just hoping that w once they go to med school, for example, their parents yeah. are, are not and doing were the same. Reading about but, this as well, supposedly um, in and around. I wonder if we have some of those tweets. Um, so, um, parents were tweeting, tweeting about this, but also here's a, um, a, an interesting response coming from the education minister of Bihar, saying, "Is this just a responsibility of the government? You know." 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because he's saying, you great. tell us what the government can do to stop cheating if parents and relatives are not ready to cooperate. And, well, he, he's right about that. No, 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 completely. Par parental guys, yes. PR style parents help class 10 students in large scale cheating. Yep, wow. yep, yep. And, wow, um, wow, 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 wow. No, but it, it is the competition that is fierce. It's a very, it is. It's a very valid and point. And actually, videos showed some school uh, inspectors slapping young girls while they were cheating on this exam. So, it's funny, but it's also very, 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 very no, no, sad. It, it, I think sheds a light on the because problem in India that you do need the education to step out of the uh, no other way of saying it, in the slum, the exactly. slum that you're in. So yeah, these parents are basically trying to promise better future, you know, for their families. Any which but way they can. Scaling also, the wall. very, very funny. Yes, and um, moving along. and uh, the next thing I wanted to show you as the, I, I mean the royal baby name was revealed, not really revealed, but. These are corgis, corgi dogs. No, they are going to name the royal baby exactly, after a corgi. It was a corgi uh, race, and then uh, actually it has an interesting name, saying a Barkingham Palace Gold Cup. Barkingham Palace, yeah, you like okay, it. Okay, well, hold on. We Let's have a watch clip. it. Yeah, yeah, we have a clip of the corgis. Let's take a look. We are here to celebrate the birth of the second royal baby. Obviously, Kate and William are expecting a younger brother or sister to Prince George next month. And what better way to celebrate and join in the excitement is by hosting the world's first ever royal corgi race, the Ludbrooks Barkingham Gold Cup Trophy. We're just joining in the fun, and obviously you can bet on the name, the sex, and hopefully maybe the winner will be the name that Kate and William choose next month. So First, the winner is yes. a girl named Alexandra. OK, do we know it's a baby girl? No. No, we don't know, right? We don't know, no. We know it is expected around April. Around a month from now? Because I was yeah, just saying, April. I don't, I mean, I have missed... I haven't seen that it's a girl, but according yeah, to the Yeah, I missed the royal uh, news, and I don't know if, you know, there was an ultrasound, or that they know the sex of the of the, the next royal um, uh, baby. Maybe they don't want to know it Maybe they don't want to know I'm don't. not sure. But whoever, so it's Alexander, which is good, because if it's, if it's a boy, it can be Alex. Right. Because and everybody not wants to be named Elizabeth. after a dog. That's you know, exactly what I want to do. Alexandra, for, yeah. she beat them all. Victoria, them all. Elizabeth, <laughs> Philippa. What's Philippa? Who knows? Like, I don't yes. know. Yes. And, and then um, I want to show you another very um, interesting item. Intriguing exhibition coming from a photographer named Roger Kisby. And it's entitled Head. And he's portraying porn stars in a very interesting way. Just... Um, I'm going to tell, honey, like I'm going to stop you for I'm a just, second. I'm going to stop you for a yeah, second. Yeah. It's called Head. Now, for us Americans... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, no, 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 yes. no, no, no. You got, you know... I, 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 yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, I, I'm wondering if you got what Head means. Fine. <laughs> They're just like us, porn stars, shown in different They're light. They're just for, like us, showing their head. Yes, yes. I'm mm -hmm. just... But um, it's actually very interesting. And the first time when, when I saw these <laughs> portraits... Kitching. Yeah, okay. you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so the first saw that, time we thought I actually really... saw that yeah. online, it was with some male friend of mine. And he was, you know, scrolling down, down. And he was, oh, I know her. I know her. I know him. And I'm like, I don't know any one of these. It's just, yeah, okay. How did you not? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quote a line from, uh, uh -huh. from a Madonna song uh, called Vogue. Um, uh, they mm -hmm. give good face. Now, fill in the blank with that picture. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, it was along. actually pretty difficult for the photographer to, you know, bring out something. He needed to show them sexually, but not really sexually, because he wanted us to see the other side of the porn stars. And it's actually very interesting if you just go no, watch no, it online. They, you, you see their heads. Um, it was a challenge, how to shoot them in a way that is not necessarily hasn't been done sexual. before. They have their sexual now, One of them look, looks like know? he's running for president, just without clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. He could have. Could have. Um, and and um, now I want to tell to tell you about uh, this new viral hashtag that is gaining momentum. It's called Je suis Bordeaux. It's like the Je suis Charlie. Je suis Charlie and right. uh, because of um, the um, the Tunisia um, deadly attack in in the Bardot Museum in the capital Tunis, which well, 23 people, 23 got, people died, yeah. died there, and uh, 20 of them were actually foreign tourists. So there is a major concern now in, in Tunisia, um, which, you know, the tourism industry the tourism there is, is very because. important there. Exactly. And this summer, you know, the, they're pretty scared that tourists will avoid um, going there because of these deadly attack and <clears> this um, terror threat. So now tourists that have been to Tunisia before are now um, hashtagging themselves, Je suis Bordeaux, uh, holding a handwritten sign saying, I will come to Tunisia this summer.
Right. It's, no, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a valid. It's nice and, and interesting. And yeah. I want, uh, have you been to the Dizengoff Center lately? Maybe yesterday around this area? It's I'm going so to I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to the other guest here. I remember I told you I have a two and a half year old. Honey, I live in that oh, center. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, for ahead. our viewers that maybe the don't know what the Zindof Center hangar, is, it's the, mall. the Zindof Center is the the mall of Tel Aviv. With is... many who play little, you know, internal exactly. playground zoos for kids. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You can <laughs> yeah, yeah. slide from an ass of an elephant. Of an there. elephant, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yesterday outside the Zindof Center mall, there was uh, an illusionist called Hezi Din. And he, look what he did. He was hung up between sky and, and, and land. And it's yeah. for real. It's not, it's a, real. It's wow. not a, a trick. I mean, it is a trick, but it's not like a Photoshop or something. That's um, kind of what it, he's, okay. He's basically glued to something, right? I, I don't know. He didn't reveal how he's doing it. I mean, it. even I, a dancer, I'm, I'm glad yeah, to I have wanted you. To ask can, you can actually. somebody actually hold themselves and alleviate themselves like that? I'm sorry, I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> uh, I think he has some... But Maybe uh, a stick. It has something to do with his right hand. With that, his right hand. That's for sure, right? Okay. But wow. But nobody, nobody knows what's... Well, child, darling, I got to tell you, that's all the time we have, but I promise you, I will not be trying this on the window I behind me. I have until tomorrow to figure no, 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 this no, no, out. No, 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 no. But next up, coming up, is sports. Do stay with us. It's going to get very exciting because some people that you wanted to win won and some that you didn't lost, who knows. Uh, but we'll have, the sp we'll have you off Bovich to tell us everything about it. So stay with us first, of course, the news. I-24 News Monday, March 23rd. Good morning edition, the place you should be. Why? Because it's the only place where you can actually meet a laid-back Shy Ringel from the Tube magazine. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> you see, every time you're in studio, I try to freak you out. And I think it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Also with Shy Ringel in studio is Yav Bovich of the Sports Magazine. Good morning Good to morning. you. Good morning. And it's my favorite segment of the show because I'm sitting with two men. Yes, rum pam pam, I said it again. Shy Ringel, the Tube magazine. Streaming. Yeah, let's talk about streaming. Uh, we're talking about a new app called Meerkat. Meerkat. Meerkat, which uh, opened, was uh, uploaded to the iOS a couple of weeks ago and already has 300,000 users. So we're going to try to understand. From the moment to the moment, it opened already 300,000 users. Yeah, okay. and uh, this morning uh, we read that it's violet. It's uh, uh, raised twelve million dollars. It's and is uh, uh, valued at forty million dollars. Nice. And it's a couple of weeks old app. So we're going to try to understand what it does and why it's so important. Um, the uh, CEO is uh, Israeli, Ben Rubin. Ah, and therefore we yeah. have a report. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. But it's a very interesting concept because it m helps you stream your life, which means that you take your phone out, you push a button, and you are live, and people can watch okay. you. I'm going to stop you for one second, and I think we, I think, I, I think I heard about it because we're going to look at the report, and it's kind of terrifying. But um, uh, yes, let's have a look at the report and break it down from there. There are always going to be a changes in App Meerkat because the way we looked at it as Twitter would be a perfect place to jumpstart the community and jumpstart right. our vision. Um, the plans that we had just got a little bit uh, pushed uh, like uh, earlier. So this say. is the last question for the Meerkat folks and then we'll, then we'll do the rest of this on, on my platform. Yo, all right. And then we'll publish that. Uh, um, a lot of folks think that sort of you, the growth you've had to date has been because you sort of ridden on the back of the Twitter graph. Once mm -hmm. you don't have that access, what do you think happens to, to Meerkat's rapid growth? So there is, so, so let me be clear on that. There is no possible way to stop tweeting to Twitter live video. There mm -hmm. is no possible way, even without the API. There's a certain way the OS built. There's a certain way the platform is built that even without API, everyone can tweet. Okay, first of all, not a report, rather a soundbite from one of the inventors. This is Ben Rubin. Ben this Rubin. is the CEO. That's the guy of who's going to make now millions and millions and yeah, millions of dollars. Yeah, he's already making millions and millions of dollars, and he's an interesting guy. Um, he has a hit on his uh, uh, in his hands. This is uh, it's Meerkat, uh, but 
just after the app was launched, Twitter decided to cut them off because Twitter already bought a, a new startup that is going to do the same thing. It's called uh, uh, Periscope. And it's not, not yet by introduced this guy, by a different way. By a different guy. Okay. So here is Ben Rubin trying to uh, tell people, look, Twitter cut us off, but we're going to do our own thing and going to uh, bring right. our own community. So it's going to be a big war because it, it's just a couple of weeks war, but everybody is talking about the fact that suddenly everybody wants to stream live live and they can stream from their mobile because mobile phones are now capable they have a good processor they have good internet usually and you can do it really easily um, streaming live meaning you basically stream when you said you stream your life i just want to explain this to the um, uh, technically challenged people yeah. as my uh, as uh, <clears throat> like myself in the uh, with our viewers you just you hit a button let's say on this application yeah and then the, the phone like shoots you. I wish we could have shown this here. And basically, I could be streaming this show also live from my show. Right? Yeah. From my phone right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jimmy Fallon already did already it did with it. Meerkat. Yeah. Um, nice. Uh, and behind the scenes, a right. lot of journalists uh, are trying it. Uh, I just saw a couple of days ago streaming live from uh, Hillary Clinton's speech um, with the guy uh, tipping Too his phone back and those. saying, uh, Hillary Clinton just yeah. said that. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Um, it's not a new concept, but it's going to be really big in the next couple of years. There's already a service called You Now that is aimed more for the teenage girls or in uh. our audience. And uh, they are looking, uh, you can, if you'll go to you now, you now, you'll see the talents. Uh, usually they are sleeping or just making breakfast. And at you can see the streaming at one end, and at the other end, you'll see a conversation of teenage girls saying, "He's so cute. It's he's adorable. Oh Look at him cutting oh the cucumber." Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the, actually a terrifying notion. Yeah, I watched the, uh, this kid who is uh, who works at a grocery store. He's he puts a camera on the counter and just like you can see him greeting people and then the uh, people are leaving and he's like he's he's looking it's for actually, jokes yeah. to say okay yeah uh that would be streaming live i'm terrified what else um okay let's talk about nintendo please nintendo is going mobile um, and do we have a clip a soundbite or a report on that um, no we don't okay <laughs> good and yeah, uh, we're talking about Nintendo. Um, the uh, Japanese company is finally, after years of um, saying that they, they will never do it, Nintendo is finally going to the mobile market, which means that if you have an iOS or an Android, uh, you will probably uh, play Mario or Zelda uh, next year. Uh, this is big. Is Nintendo big still as big as they were? No. They're not, right? Nintendo's no. like both. But they're a very good game company. Nintendo uh, was hit pretty hard because they decided to stay on the console markets and on their own console market. Which means that if you want to play a Nintendo game, you need to uh, buy a Nintendo console. console. Nintendo console is not that good of a console. It has a very good game library, but it's not a very good console for it is right. its own. So um, we talked about it in our show that Finally, Nintendo is making the move to mobile. That will mean a lot of money for a lot of people. Uh, their stock is up uh, <laughs> already yeah, yeah, over the weekend because um, investors really asked Nintendo to do exactly that. But uh, they're going to face some challenges. Uh, Clearly. Yeah. Could we hear all about that on the show, The Tube? Yeah. Okay, what time is the show, The Tube? <laughs> We're moving to 9.40. Yeah. Plug that. 9.40. Yeah. 9.40 local time, Middle Eastern time. That's a.m. or p.m., honey? That's p.m. Thank you. <laughs> 9.40 meaning 21.40 for those of a military persuasion. Mm -hmm. That would be the tube, shy ringle, anything and everything that's tech. But who cares when we have sports in our lives? Yes, I made that transition, Yoav Bulovic. I just did. Um, <laughs> look at this. That's Yoav Bulovic. But with We're the moving from games to games. To, from games to games. And the biggest game last night, right? Indeed. Yes. In Spain, the famous Clásico, Barcelona versus Real Madrid. Not only the whole of Spain is watching, but the whole of Europe and all of the world is watching. 
and uh, it was just a, a fabulous show. It wasn't an amazing game, but we saw a very fascinating one because first half, Real Madrid were so much better. We can see here almost Ronaldo. We can see him now almost scores. It hits the bar. But later, Ronaldo did score. Real, um, Barcelona also scored in the first half. Right, which made it very, very exciting and Barcelona interesting. Barcelona actually scored the first goal, but Real equalized. Real were so much better. Wow. And you thought it would end up being 3-1, 4-1, because they had all those opportunities. But second half, what happened is that Messi started playing better, and the biggest name, the biggest story of the game, Luis Suarez. Luis Suarez, the Euro Uruguayan, a striker who scored the final goal, who scored the goal, scored the winning goal, and we all know what happened with Luis Suarez during the World Cup. Right. When he bit the Italian player because yes. he had all those biting incidents. He played in England before, in Liverpool it happened. He played before that in Holland it happened. So basically, Luis Suarez, this very famous uh, great player, is, who is just going off biting people, was really, you don't have to explain was to me really who he defamed yeah. during the World Cup. And Liverpool sold him because, you know, everybody, the whole press was on him. Barcelona said, okay, we'll take him. But it was like not such a big story because, you know, everybody thought, everybody was talking about Luis Suarez, the, the maniac. But, and he was ejected. The vampire. Yeah, and he was yeah. ejected. He was suspended for a long time, for three to four months. And when he came back to Barcelona two months ago, he really didn't play well. He couldn't score goals. He couldn't assist. All the things he did all his life, suddenly he stopped doing. But really lately, last few weeks... You gotta let weeks, the guy keep biting. Seriously. They yeah, have to let him bite. But the, guy yeah, started, the guy started <laughs> biting on the pitch. Lately, he started scoring a lot of goals, and he scored the most important goals of the year for Barcelona because he beat Manchester City in the Champions League, and now he beat Real Madrid at home in a Clásico, which will probably enable Barcelona to win the championship. So Luis Suarez ends up being the biggest winner, not huh. Leo Messi, not the Brazilian Neymar. It's actually Luis it's Suarez, it's Luis the Suarez. guy that the whole world just mocked. And laughed at. And, and laughed at, the, yeah. rightfully so maybe. But still, he shows he really has a game in addition to his, you he's know... He's just very emotional. He likes to bite people. He's very emotional. He, he says that it's something that he cannot control because he needs to win at any cost, at any way. And he just goes crazy, you know? He sometimes goes crazy. At the risk crazy. of yet again speaking about my children, which I do quite often, you know... Very my childish, two, yeah. No, my two-year-old has that need to orally, you know, bite things. And sometimes and you need to sort of get rid of it by the time you're five. Yeah, so some, of us, some of us don't get rid some of, of it. Some of us never let yeah, never let yeah. And they still do well. <laughs> okay. And? And, uh, okay, let's go to the... English Clasico because yesterday a few hours before the Spanish one we had the Manchester United the Liverpool Manchester United game which is the biggest game in England in terms of viewership in the world also it's just as big as the Spanish one because the English Premier League is being watched all over the world and over there also we had a very very dramatic story because both teams are playing for the right to play in the Champions League next year. It's a very big game. Now, Steven Gerrard, the biggest Liverpool icon, the guy who's leaving the club after 20 years at the end of the year going to the U.S., he didn't start the game because lately the team has been playing well without him, although he's the biggest uh, star, the biggest right. name. And the team played terribly the first half, and they were trailing. And the coach put Steven Gerrard in the game, and, you know, a minute into the game, Steven Gerrard just, you know, the Manchester United guy tackled him. And then what he did, he stepped on the foot of the Manchester United player and was ejected from the game. So, Steven Gerrard, that's how he will be remembered in his last game versus Manchester United, being As thrown out of the game. With a red card. With a red card. Very, very, very sad. Very sad for all the Liverpool fans like myself, who really... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Not making fun of you. Yeah. really have a soft spot for this guy who's been, you know, a, an exemplary captain all those years who never won a championship. He's like kind of a tragic hero because he really, he did everything he That's could. That's kind of like somebody spilling water on your Macintosh, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he did, yeah. He did everything he could and Can it just wasn't yeah. enough. And then at the end of the day, you know, the end of his Liverpool Ooh. career, when he can beat Manchester United, get his team to the Champions League, finish like a hero, 
no. he gets a red card. Just to show, you know, comes to show us that in sports sometimes the, the bad endings are just as, you know, fabulous. As fabulous as, as, as the, the good yes. endings. I'm, I'm hoping you don't start crying, you because clearly uh, this is touching personal. Uh, yeah. Finally, though. I cried yesterday. You, you did, didn't you? Course, you did. Yeah. Okay, some people cry because of elections. <laughs> some cry because of that. Yeah, today and. I'm laughing, yeah. <clears throat> so... Let's finish with tennis. You know, let's talk yes. about another sports hero, Roger Federer. The aristocracy Fed sport. Yes, yes. yes. Sharangil and I play tennis quite often. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all love tennis. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh huh. And, and the biggest name in tennis, maybe ever, Roger Federer. You know, the Swiss legend. Yes. Who won 17 Grand Slams, who is 32, who has not been at his best lately. But last but night, playing against uh, Novak Djokovic, who is the heir apparent, who is today's greatest player. Federer giving him a great, great fight. We can see here Novak Djokovic, the great Serb, the, young, the younger guy. But Djokovic... How old is Djokovic? Djokovic is 27 and Federer is 32. Right. Now, Djokovic already has eight Grand Slams. Federer has 17. It seems like a huge gap. Federer has 17 Grand Slams? 17, so it's yeah. ridiculous. The most... What is the name of uh, the, the sister of the Williams? Rafael Nadal? No, I'm talking about uh, the Williams Serena? Serena no, has Serena has 20. Right. Yeah, Serena, Serena is, is like at, a machine at a league know, of her a, own, and yeah, she exactly. could have she could have had forty, you know, because you know for many years she was into fashion, into I was screen looking at some of the into screenwriting, screen writing. I'm trying something different. She is just so talented, yeah. this woman, so amazingly talented that she can do other things and still be the and best. And still have it. twenty grand slams. And slides. she's good in other things as well, you know. She's just amazing. Kind of like me, but moving the so back so, to yeah. nobody gets my jokes. <laughs> moving back though. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a joke, Yael. <laughs> exactly. But moving back to Federer, is he like off the, you know, so he loses. He's, yeah, miserably. but he does, he does it, you know, classy because, you know, he still is very, very, very good. Yesterday, he almost beat Djokovic. He beats all the rest. But today, beating the great Serb, Novak Djokovic, is just slightly impossible for, for Federer. So he's still very, very good, but he's not the best. And he just won't give up, you know, and that's something. Many Federer fans say, listen, we want to see you just as number one. If you're not number one, maybe you should yeah. retire. But the guy doesn't listen to, to other people's what they think and what they say. He's still very, very good, but not the best. Not and the that's best. also a way for some of us to to finish their career. No, no, completely. Sadly, all the time we have, because Shai Ringel and I do have to go play tennis, um, as we do every morning, <laughs> in between our Nintendos. You have all of it, great stuff. I mean, tennis is the one sport I do understand something about. But for all of you, at home, I-24 News Morning Edition. That was it for us today. The beginning of the week, March 23rd. Don't forget to check us out on all those social network. Try to stream us live, be it Facebook, Twitter, whatnot. And of course, tune in tomorrow morning for another edition of the Morning Edition, the place to start your day, because you just have to. That will be it. Thank you.